Dr. Snow, Chapter 1 Dashing through the snow in my thousand-horse race car sleigh, down the streets I fly, keeping crooks at bay. Morning, a small Midwestern town in mid-December, a light snow falling, pedestrians, the occasional sidewalk Santa, Christmas lights, trim trees, dogs wearing silly sweaters, People wearing equally silly hats and clothes, carrying stacks of wrapped packages. Storefronts draped in garland and blinking multicolored lights. A little blonde girl with a big smile and a lollipop the size of her head. Christmas carols under publicly dressed, the smell of roasted chestnuts and pretzels in the air. All is calm. All looked right. But was it? Nicholas Saint sighed and parked his expensive red and white sports car across the street from the first National Savings and Loan. He wrapped his soft, light brown cashmere scarf a little tighter around his neck, adjusted his matching fedora, overcoat, and faux leather gloves. A former Formula One racer, he knew he would rather be driving his car through the snow, but duty called, and public safety came first. The red and white knight must protect and defend. Oh, all right, if I must, I must. The car door shut with a bang. Jack Frost already nipping at his nose. A black sedan ran the red light. A pedestrian seemed to recognize him. Move along, cross the street, get it done. Then maybe go out for some ice cream. The corner bank was a well-built granite structure with an attractive Romanesque facade decorated with the festive colored lights and green garland of the holiday season. This was further punctuated by Salvation Army Santa dressed in red and white, ringing a handbell and smiling through his white cotton beard. This was always a source of amusement to Mr. Saint. They never quite get it right, do they? He reached into the pocket of his overcoat and removed a crisp $100 bill, folded it and slipped it into the red bucket beside the faux Santa. He then tipped his light brown fedora and smiled at the volunteer. I must say, I like your suit said Mr. Saint with more than a hint of levity. I have all of mine custom tailored by Versace. Yours reminds me more of off-the-shelf bargain bin Santa's warehouse. He smiled before the comment could sink in and added, Have a Merry Christmas. And a Merry Christmas to you, sir. Nicholas Saint grabbed the brass handle of a large solid glass door with a gloved left hand. He pulled it open large room with a high vaulted ceiling, three security guards with radios and guns, one at the door, one at the back, one walking the floor, nine tellers, 47 customers, no children, thank God. A large Christmas tree in the center, snow falling on the skylight, teller lines, velvet ropes wrapped with garland and lights, cold hard marble floor, blood red entrance rug stained with slush, about a five minute wait in line, they were cutting it close. Hope Theta did his job. Smile, stay calm, act naturally. The first guard was a young man, fit and athletic, standing sentry-like near the front entrance. His Smith & Wesson 38 Special Revolver safely holstered on his right hip, and his communication radio tethered securely to his left. He appeared alert and ready, and probably held this post a good portion of his workday based on his relaxed but focused demeanor. The second guard was standing on the left end of the teller stations, at the far end of the room. He was much older, shorter, and more advanced in the waistline. He was clothed and armed in like fashion, but appeared to be much less calm and confident. He may have been battle fatigued, or maybe he was just a semi-retired seasonal sentry. The third security guard was a fairly tall female with the physique of a physical trainer and the expression of a focused martial artist. Her short, dark hair looked military regulation and she was somewhat of a contrast to the otherwise warm, festive atmosphere of the establishment. She patrolled with purpose, inspecting each customer with unabashed scrutiny. His inspection done, Nick Saint strode forward towards the gold posts and red Christmas light wrapped ropes of the teller line, singled and switched back four times, 
before emptying into the open area in front of the continuous teller stations. With nine such employees filling every position, the queue was moving relatively briskly for its length. The queue experience was somewhat uneventful, as most of his line mates were too busy trying not to make eye contact to, to deserve any friendly chit-chat. Nick had come to expect this from Americans, especially in a bank, but not always during the holidays. It was as if they didn't want to set off any alarms that could potentially get them in trouble. The same was true at airports, especially of late. It was a pity. He emerged at the premier position after only four or five minutes and was promptly waved forward by an attractive female teller wearing a floppy Santa hat. She had long, light brown hair, a perky face, and a nameplate on her desk that said, Betty White. Good morning and Merry Christmas. What can I do for you on this wonderful day? Nick smiled his famous smile with a twinkle in his eyes and all the trimming and he removed his gloves and he replied to the contagiously courteous clerk. Hello, Betty. How are you this fine morning? Oh, busy, you know. It's just the usual holiday grind, but I don't let it bother me. What does complaining about it get you? Besides nasty looks and a stocking full of coal, not much. Betty had looked down at her computer display, but Nick's comment made her look back at him with a jolt of recognition. Hey. Don't I know you from somewhere? Haven't we met before? It's entirely possible. Don't get me wrong, Betty, but I do get around. Nick gave her a wink and then quickly changed the subject to the supposed purpose of his visit. I'd like to check the balance on my Christmas Club account and see about opening one for next year. Thank you, Betty. Oh, of course. It never hurts to start early. Let's see what we got. What's the name on the account? The name Saint, Nick Saint. And the account number? 3141-0007. Betty typed the information into her keyboard, and moments later the account information popped up on her display. She looked at the balance and nearly lost hers. She was speechless for a moment, as the number of digits made her do a triple take. But before she could convey the staggering amount, a deafening sound ripped through the air and bounced off the walls. It was the unmistakable sound of gunfire. Betty gasped and looked towards the front entrance. What she saw made her stomach clench with fear and a surge of panic flow through her body. Five men wearing black coveralls and ski masks holding very lethal automatic weapons were spreading out over the lobby floor. She could see the limp body of her friend, Andy Jackson, the Thor security guard, lying motionless on the floor, blood leaking from his torso onto the white marble floor. He has a family, thought Betty. They just had a baby. <laughs> to her right, the back security guard, Waldo Jones, had already dropped his weapon and had his hands straight up. The rover guard, Maggie Holmes, was locked in a loop of indecision. She was in a semi-crouched position with her hands at either side about a foot from her hips, looking like a gunslinger about to draw but frozen in place. What could she do? She was clearly outgunned. The gunmen were in a B formation with the leader at the point. He started barking orders with a frantic banshee wail that made Betty's blood curdle. She also noticed with the part of her brain that was still thinking clearly that Nick's saint had vanished. Where did he go? Everybody on the floor, face down, arms and legs spread, bombs on the ground now. Anybody standing in two seconds will be dead. Betty dropped to the floor and assumed the position. Her heart was beating so fast and hard she thought it was going to explode. She did not have time or the guts to push the silent alarm with her foot. She hoped that one of the other tellers or officers would. Maggie Holmes stood her ground. She knew it was suicide, but she would not back down. Someone had to stop them before more lives were lost, and maybe she could take a couple of them with her to hell. She 
drew a pistol and pointed at the closest scumbag. He turned and laughed. Hey, boss, look what we got here, a hero. Yeah, quipped his closest comrade. And it's a girl. Don't do it, Maggie, yelled Officer Waldo from the floor. It's not worth your life. The leader turned towards the trio and screamed. What are you morons waiting for? Kill her! Maggie dropped to the ground and rolled. She came up and fired at the leader's head. She missed. He didn't. Waldo cringed. Betty cried. Maggie dropped. Dead. The leader laughed. Now move out! No more fuck-ups! The gunmen spread out, and three of them jumped over the teller stations and started opening the cash drawers. Betty could see them rifling through the drawers and filling bags with money. They would soon be at her station. It was funny, but the back of her mind kept saying, Where did Nick Saint go? How did he move so fast? She couldn't understand why her brain was worried about that when death was looming only moments away. The lead larcenist stood in front of the Christmas tree and watched his plan working flawlessly. They had thought of every possible problem. They had moved in with military precision. It would take less than two minutes to clear out the cash drawers and two more for the vault. Each man would carry four bags and they would be gone in four minutes with five million dollars before the cops could even arrive. It was foolproof. Then they heard it. Not an alarm, but a very strange sound. It sounded like sleigh bells coming from the hallway that led to the restrooms in the side exit, the exit the bandits were planning to use. Maybe it was someone coming out of the restroom that didn't know the bank was being robbed. Maybe it was an employee coming from the break room. He knew the floor plan and layout of the building by memory. He was ready for this. Hey, he yelled to his flanking man. The hallway, check it out. Shoot anything that moves. The second man waved affirmative and started for the hallway. A few frightened but curious patrons raised their heads to see what was going on. Curiosity overrode fear for some, but most remained as motionless as possible. The gunman disappeared into the hallway, followed by a few seconds of silence. Gunfire. A burst that lasted one full second and then abruptly stopped. There was no answering gunfire, only silence. After several seconds more, no one emerged, but... Then, as if nothing had happened, the sound of sleigh bells. Betty could not see what was going on, but it definitely sounded like something was going wrong. She started to wonder if Mr. Sate had something to do with it. She couldn't see how an unarmed man could do anything against these creeps. But there was something about him that she couldn't quite put her finger on. A second gunman jumped over the teller stations and headed for the hallway a little slower than his comrade. Moments later, another volley of automatic gunfire, also ending abruptly, and also followed by silence, and then the ringing bell. That does it. Both of you in the hallway. Bring down whoever or whatever is making that racket and find out what happened to the others. I'm not taking any more chances. The fourth and fifth gunmen dropped the filled bags at their leader's feet and cautiously crept towards the hallway and the ominous sound of bells. Then they went in, one at a time, crouched low with rifles at the ready. Gunfire, a noise, more gunfire, then a noise that sounded like soft clay being thrown against the wall, then dead silence. Then, just like before, the sleigh bells ringing, reminiscent of the church bells of Notre Dame drumming in Quasimodo's brain. It had the same effect on the final gunman's head, and he screamed with rage into the otherwise silent expanse of the great room. He agitated the air with a wail that could have been heard a hundred miles away. The bells kept ringing, jingling, taunting him. The patrons and customers started to stir noticeably, and many realized that something strange was going on. Someone was neutralizing the bandits one by one, and whoever it was rang the bell calling the desperados to their doom like rats to the Pied Piper. The last bandito grabbed as many bags as he could carry with one arm and hoisted his weapon with the other. Then he crept over to the hallway 
and after a pause he entered. The bells were getting louder in his brain, scraping on his skull, driving him insane. He rounded the corner and saw a flash of red. He turned and fired his weapon. The red became a blur. It tried to follow it. It darted about nebulously. Then, just as he was about to fire again, something hit him hard and square in the face, cold and white, and he faded into unconsciousness. The last thing he remembered was the sound of the bells. Agent Smythe calmly surveyed the room, not with the airs of a tourist checking out the pyramids of Giza, but with a well-trained eye that missed nothing. There was someone here that had the information he needed. He was as certain of that fact as he was that the sun would rise in the east the following morning. The agent in black had been tracking this do-gooder for some time now. The perp's Emma was as clear and familiar to him as the ceiling of his own bedroom. Smythe knew every crack, every flaw, and every subtle gradient of shading. This incident had the mystery man's name all over it, and Smythe was about to reveal his identity. As police officers and FBI agents took photographs and interviewed victims, Agent Smythe became aware of one particular bank employee speaking to a detective enthusiastically. He knew it immediately. She was the one. He approached the two and caught the tail end of her last sentence. Mr. Nick Saint, he was here and then he vanished. Vanished, you say, said Agent Smythe, interrupting the detective. Smythe's dark sunglasses, black suit, and blank expression told the officer immediately that he was needed somewhere else, probably on the other side of the room. He was gone almost as quickly as Mr. Saint. Vanished, like a magic trick, is that what you mean? Petty was startled by the sudden appearance of Agent Smythe, but she too knew right away he was important. No one questioned Agent Smythe, especially at first glance. Well, I was talking to him, helping him with his account, and whoosh, he was gone. Just as the robbery began, in my mind's eye, it was literally as if he just evaporated into thin air, but then again, I was a little distracted at that moment, so he probably just slipped away in all the excitement. Of course, that is logical. No one disappears into thin air. It is physically impossible, or at least in my experience. Agent Smythe paused and reflexively checked his earpiece, dangling noticeably from his right ear. You said the name Saint, Nick Saint. Is that correct, Miss White? Yes, his name is Nick Saint. I have his account information right here. Would you like to see it? Agent Smythe smiled the smile of a man that had finally reached the end of a very long and winding road. Yes, Miss Smythe. In fact, I would be absolutely delighted. In the hallway, a group of agents, officers, and reporters milled about the scene. All of the perpetrators were still alive, unconscious, and tied up in a neat little package. They were circled in the center of the hallway, bound together back to back, with what looked like red ribbon. On top of the huddle was a large white bow. An oversized gift tag was pinned to one of them with the words written in red and green sparkle ink that said, Merry Christmas to the Chief of Police from Santa with Love. A detective peered into his viewfinder and snapped a flash picture. Smythe chuckled to himself. This time Mr. Saint had gone too far.